Spectron is one of Octane's most powerful features, letting you generate procedural geometry at render time without using traditional meshes. In this video I'll walk you through a Blender project with multiple examples, showing different ways to use Vectron. Let's get started. This scene shows how is it possible to use any mesh with Vectron. In this case I'm using uh, a model of a Suzanne, and if we turn on the preview, we can see how Vectron displacement is applied to it. If we want to use any mesh in Vectron, we need to transform it into an SDF. To do that, we just select the object and from the object data uh, panel, we look for the mesh volume option and then enable mesh volume SDF. As you can see, we can choose the, the voxel size. Uh, that's very important considering that we want a good detail when we're converting the mesh. And yeah, that's basically it. So if we go back to our vector item, we can see how I've used an object data node with Suzanne, the Suzanne object selected, and now is an SDF. And I've connected a transformed uh, geo output to the vector displacement input directly. So you can see now I can do this kind of things. Let me change the voxel size to something like 0 0.05. Yeah, that's better. And yeah, that's really it. And as you can see now, I can use subtractive objects. Uh, it's a toroid in this case. And also union driven objects. So as you can see now, Suzanne just behaves as an SDF object. There are two important things you have to consider when using a mesh. Um, first, be sure to set the coordinates to Octane in the object data. That's important because if you don't do that, as you can see, the object transformation will not be correct. So always set it to Octane and then you may want to hide the mesh object as exactly as I did in this case and the only way to do that is here from uh, the object properties where you can just go here in the offset transform option and you need to activate the octane offset transform you see now it's disabled so we can see the original mesh if you enable it, then you'll be free to set the scale to zero. This is hiding the object. This option is pretty powerful. You can play with it and get some very interesting results. In this case, I'm just changing the octaves of the noise, controlling the displacement. But yes, you can change the contrast, change the gamma, again the octaves, and just get interesting effects. Of course it's still possible to deform our mesh using any any deformer or just editing it as I'm doing right now. This scene shows a simple setup uh, composed by two vector primitives, a bow and a box. And this is pretty easy. We have the two nodes here, two vector primitive nodes, and then we have the relative object data connected to the transform. Coordinates set to Octane and of course here I specified the right empty I'm using to control the objects. So I can select any 
empty here, move it around and scale it, do whatever I, I want. I can rotate it, but you notice that if I rotate the, the empties, the texture is not following. So we're working work coordinates right now. We will see how to set uh, different behaviors so the texture behaves in local coordinates instead. And yeah, I have a nice texture connected to the vector displacement here. So, you know, I can control it, I can change the offset and the height. I can also change the noise texture. So, as always, gamma, the the contrast, and and get totally different results. This scene is very similar to the previous one. We have two primitives. I can select the empty and move the primitive around. I can transform it. But as you may notice now, the texture is correctly following the transformation of the object. So, you know, we can scale, we can move it around, we can rotate it. To achieve this, I had to use two different vector displacement nodes, one connected to the box and the other to the sphere, and uh, I've also had to add a projection to the noise texture. So, if you click on the plus here, you know, a projection will be automatically added and uh, it's an XYZ to UVW projection. Um, yeah, all we, you have to do at that point is to connect the transform out to the XYZ transformation input. So the object data will be controlling both the box transformation and the texture transformation. So this is just great, but as you can see, uh, if I scale the object on one axis, the texture will stretch. That's because uh, we're controlling it using the empty transformation. But we also have another control here in the texture itself, and we can use it to independently control the texture transformation. So we can scale it, we can rotate it or translating and do whatever we need to do. Let's not forget we can also use the options in the nodes to change the height, the, the width and the depth of our primitives. Of course we're talking about the box, in the case of the sphere we can just change the radius. So yeah, that's another useful scene you can you can study. This scene shows the switch feature at work. It's very useful and basically you can find switch nodes uh, for all the attributes you can use in Octane and uh, let's see how it works. I've created several procedural texture setup and I've connected those to the inputs of the texture switch. We can add any number of input and of course remove them. So as I want to uh, use one of those uh, inputs I can just change this number. So now we're using this input here but yes we can switch to two, three, four, five. As we switch to six, uh, of course, uh, since there is no uh, input, it's going to show a result where nothing is connected. Now, since we can basically remodulate any procedural texture using a gradient, well, here I did the same uh, for the gradients. I use texture switch to connect two different gradients. So right now we're using the first, this one, and look at how useful using a gradient to modulate 
uh, procedural texture can be. Or we can use the other one. As you can see here, we have way more uh, keyframes. And even in this case, we can just move them around, change the values, and so on. And yeah, we can also take a look at how the other textures look with this second gradient here. Or back to the first. It's pretty powerful. This scene is basically identical to the previous one. We're using the input switch to change the procedural texture we're using for displacement, but we're also using the same texture to color the mesh using a gradient map in this case. So, as you can see, I can move the, the keyframes of the gradient around. I can create a new one. And, as always, I can use the switch to test the same setup with different procedural textures. Even in this case, playing with the displacement height, it's really, really cool. And, you know, what we can do also is to add another gradient. So I'm going to use two gradients in this case. And, you know, the first one is modulating the the first procedural texture and then the result goes into this other gradient which colors everything and yeah so very cool in this scene I'm using a spherical field to mix two different textures. Uh, as you can see here we have this mixed texture node with two textures connected to the first and second texture input. Changing the amount will show one or the other. And the spherical field is controlling where the transition happens. So we have some controls here we can use, like the core radius, if we want to make the transition sharper, for example, we can raise up the core radius value, and now everything becomes even more evident. We can move the empty around, we can scale it, we can rotate it, of course, once we have scaled it on one axis, like this, as you can see, the rotation is going to affect the transition as well. This is a pretty powerful way of mixing textures for sure. We have several kind of fields in Octane that can be used not only with Vectron of course but also for general texturing or object scattering. The output of the mixed texture node is plugged into the texture input of the Vectron displacement and also uh, into the input texture of the gradient we're using to color the mesh. Very useful and for sure very fun to play with. That's another scene using uh, fields. In this case I'm using a planner field. So you can see the effect of it. I can also rotate the empty like this, I can scale and yeah, I can change the fall off distance as well. So this is another pretty powerful way of using fields to, to mix to different textures. This is another similar scene, we're using an angular field in this case, so we can change the core angle, we can 
change the fall off angle for both sides as you can see we can if we set it zero we will have a very sharp transition but yes we can change this value independently and also we can just move the the empty around we can rotate it in any direction and yes another field type we can use to mix different procedural textures in this scene i'm using the shape field uh, basically you can use any mesh transform it into an sdf we already know how to do that and yeah that's it we can then move the object around so it is affecting the transition and in, in this case we have a fall off distance we have an offset that we can use so again another pretty powerful another pretty powerful feature for sure and yeah so remember to transform an object into an SDF you have to go here in the mesh volume option and just enable the mesh volume SDF in this scene I'm mixing textures in a different way you can see I'm using uh, Cinema 4D noises in this case which offer a lot of different noises and yeah I'm using a mixed texture node so basically we have those two textures connected and to mix them to control the the blending I'm using a noise texture and as usual we can use the gamma the contrast uh, the number of octaves or you know any available attribute in the texture to control the transition okay let's raise up the contrast so we can better see what's going on here we can now use the gamma to control the transition between the two procedural textures also it's possible to use the transform node to change the placement of the transition and everything is connected to the vector and displacement node pretty easy there's a lot more to explore and I'll be sharing more tutorials soon covering advanced setups, shading tricks and creative workflows. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.